Hello and welcome to Praying on Purpose. Our conversation began over two months ago with what appeared at the time to be a very simple question. Why do we pray? Why do we daven? What are we hoping to accomplish when we pray? Are we looking to change ourselves? Or perhaps are we somehow hoping to change the will of God himself? And we pointed out at the time that while asking this question may be simple, answering it is anything but, and it's going to take time to develop the patience to consider different points of view that may appear on the surface to be inconsistent one with the other. They may seem to be mutually exclusive, but the reality is that in order to develop a healthy, balanced perspective on tefillah, we're going to have to hold simultaneously different perspective, different points of view, which really seem on the surface as if they cannot be reconciled. We have to, on the one hand, consider, as we spent the better time of two months saying, that prayer is designed to get us to grow. It is to develop a greater sense of self-awareness. We are supposed to use davening as an opportunity to think about our priorities in life and perhaps over time reprioritize to better position ourselves to receive God's blessing. From this perspective, we argued, prayer is not to be seen as transactional in nature. It's not that I just go ahead, open my sitter, plug in certain coordinates, and now, like an ATM machine, out comes exactly what it is that I was looking for. On the other hand, we pointed out last week, that we see from the very beginning of time, God creates within nature. He embeds within the Bria a process and systems which require prayer in order to facilitate God's ability to give to us what we need. So rain, as an example, as being something which is necessary for our survival, for our very existence, is something which requires prayer in order for it to truly and properly be delivered to mankind in the way in which we need. And we have to try over time to hold these two ideas together in our mind at the same time. I'd like to continue that perspective this week by sharing with you an insight based on a Gemara in Masechus Brachos Davava Medbez. The Gemara tells us in the name of Chelbo, Le'olam Yehi Adam Zahir B'Tfilas HaMincha. A person should be very careful when davening Tfilas Mincha. We should take it, so to speak, seriously. We should be diligent when it comes to the performance of this prayer. Sharei Eliyahu Lo Nene El B'Tfilas Mincha. Because Aliyah Navi was answered at the time of Tilas Mincha. This is a reference to the famous story that is recorded in Sefer Malachim, the standoff between Aliyah Navi and the V.A. Baal. And there was a very dramatic moment in which, in which Aliyah Navi petitioned to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for his assistance. And it was a moment in which clearly Aliyah's prayers were very, very effective in that moment. And Rabbi Chalbo says, oh, so we have to try to tap into that power. When did that happen? Tilas Mincha time. So Olam Yehi Adam Zahir, we should be very careful when it comes to so in the Sefer Nachlas Yaakov, the author of the Nesiva Samishpat and Amchosh Mishpat, so he asks, why is it that Rav Chalbo says we should be so careful when it comes to the performance of Mincha? Because Eliyahu, why not say because it was instituted by, by Yitzchak Avinu? Chazal tell us, and we're going to discuss this over the next few weeks, that Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they instituted the Tfilos of Shachos Mincha Marif. And so therefore, why do we need to turn to Eliyahu? Why not just sim- simply say, a person should be careful when it comes to the performance of Tfilos Mincha, because Yitzchak Avinu instituted Tfilas Mincha. And so therefore that itself should be more than enough reason for us to, so to speak, take this seriously. And the Nachos Yaakov answers that, you know, there are many, many people who wonder, how could it be that we dive in, in order to change God's will? That doesn't make any sense. After all, we can't change God's will. And so therefore they say, well, it must be that prayer is really about changing us. It's not about changing the will of God, but it's about changing God himself. But he says, and we have to be very, very careful not to simply accept this as being fact. He says, He says, the truth of the matter is, heaven forbid that this should be our only perspective. We should recognize that, in fact, tefillah can have a certain reactive effect, that tefillah is something that can activate the Ratzon of Hashem. How does that work? Says the Nachlis Yaakov, I don't know how it works. He says, I don't know what works. He says, but I'll tell you the truth. I don't understand a lot of things about God. There are many, many things that we don't understand. He says, Kamosha in Masigim Ahuso, I don't understand the nature of God at all. Kach in Masigim Ratzon of Adaito. How am I supposed to understand exactly how he works at all times and what his will is and how he operates? He says, for example, we don't understand how it's possible for God to know the future, but yet at the same time, we have Bechir Chavshis, free will. But we've long accepted that there are things that are beyond our understanding. And so therefore, he says, we have to be very, very careful not to simply surrender and to say, well, it can't be that we can affect the will of God. And so therefore, it has to be that tefillah is merely a way of getting ourselves to change. 
He says, because to reach that conclusion is basically saying that we can understand everything about God, and that is not true. And so therefore, he says, the Gemara chooses to focus on Eliyahu Anavi as being sort of the inspiration for our perspective on prayer, or Tzvilas Mincha in particular, because we have to understand that there are things that we don't understand. Could it be, is it possible, that there are certain times throughout the day in which our prayer potentially could be more effective? And the answer is yes. And he says, now, if prayer was merely means to look inside, if it was merely a matter of my own personal introspection, so what does it make a difference, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening? Why should it make a difference whether or not I say certain words, I'm standing in a certain place, if I have a minion, if I don't have a minion? Why should any of this matter? It really should just matter what sort of mood I'm in, and to what extent right now I am open to change. But we don't say that. We say that there is, in fact, there are certain times, there are certain places, there's there's a, there, there's a certain sura. There's a format that's a structure to fila, and that matters. And the fact that that matters shows us that there are things about prayer that are simply beyond our understanding. And we have to have, he says, a tremendous amount of humility when we approach prayer. Because as I've been saying, prayer is something which we need to personalize. We need to understand it and, 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 and employ all of its power and resources being something that could really motivate us and inspire us, and enable us to develop a closer relationship with ourselves and with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. all of that is true. But at the same time, we need to demonstrate a serious amount of humility and understanding and appreciating that there are things that we simply don't understand. There are many things in the world that we don't understand. And he said, this may be one of them. How does this work? And if we're going to get stuck with the question, well, how could it be that I can go ahead and change God's will, that I can do something which is going to have sort of some sort of effect on the Rabboni Shalom. He says, don't try to understand it because it is something that we simply cannot understand. I know that this past sukkah, so I was having a conversation in my sukkah with a family where we were discussing the whole concept of saying slichos at certain times in the early morning hours after chatzos. And there was a little bit of a discussion as to what's so terrible about saying tefillah, uh, about saying slichos at night. I don't want to have that conversation right now. And I'm not saying it's terrible, but it's pretty well known that uh, that there's a halakha debate around this topic. And there are those that say we really should not say uh, slichos in the hours, in the evening hours before chatzos. And again, without getting into the particulars of that right now, uh, the reason that is brought down is because this is, this is a time where there is uh, an overabundance of din in the world. And it's not a time that we're going to be really successful in our endeavors. It seems almost as if, because I'm telling us that HaKadosh Baruch is more receptive to our prayers, our Slichos prayers in the early morning hours when there is an abundance of Rachamim in the world. Now this, if we take it from our very limited human perspective, this is something which makes no sense. We say, what does that mean? Like God's in a better mood in the morning and he's a little grumpy at night? How could that be? That doesn't make any sense. And the truth of the matter is, you're right. It really doesn't make any sense. From our very limited perspective, it's a very strange idea. After all, Kaddish Baruch Hu is not moody. Kaddish Baruch Hu is not sometimes, in, you know, it's like, it's, you know, it, it's better to approach him after he had some rest. It, it's not the way it works. We're talking about the Bona Shalom. We're talking about a Kaddish Baruch Hu, an unlimited um, uh, omniscient being, one that we cannot even begin to explain. And, and the answer is exactly. We cannot begin to explain. And so therefore, says the Nachlis Yaakov, there are things about the universe that we don't understand. And we have to understand that. We have to accept that. And if we can, then maybe we can respect the, the format, the structure of and the expectations of davening in a way that allows us to commit ourselves to a process in which we don't always have the satisfaction of knowing, why am I doing this right now this way? Why am I saying this precisely here? And if we're going to try to always understand it squared away with our own knowledge, we may get very frustrated at times. We read yesterday in Parshas Noach, towards the end of the Parsha, the Dor HaFlaga, there was a generation of people who they tried to build a great tower to ascend the heavens. Without getting into the details right now, Rashi tells us there were several reasons as to why these group of people motivated. One of them was the fact that the scientists of the day, they figured out that based on their calculations, every 1,656 years, I believe, the heavens open up, and the, the rains come down and destroy the entire world. And so therefore, they wanted to build scaffolding. They wanted to go ahead and engineer uh, some massive uh, structure which would hold up the heavens to prevent the world from being destroyed by another flood. Now, when we think about this, it seems completely absurd on every level. I mean, the whole thing is, is w w w were they crazy? So, But the, the reality is that, yeah, it is absurd, and they were a little crazy. But really what we're seeing over here is a primitive uh, generation that is using the science of the day to try to understand the universe to the best of their ability. And based on that, they 
they come to certain conclusions and, and based on those conclusions they do things that you know looking backwards we say well that, that that didn't make any sense but the truth is we do the same thing we, there are many times that we, we we try to use again using the incredible amount of knowledge that we have amassed over the course of time and we live in a time where there's been incredible discovery and scientific advancement and an understanding of the universe within and without but 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 there's still a limit to that there's a great limit to that and the nachos yakov says ultimately in in, in my opinion he says tfila is poeles ratzon yizbarach tfila operates in a way in which it is i'm going to go back to the word that i was using in the past it is transactional in nature tfila has the ability to go ahead and set certain things into motion which really have an impact on myself on the people around me and perhaps on a cosmic level and if we're going to try to understand this we're going to be very frustrated because the truth of the matter is, it is not understandable. So we have to try, in conclusion, once again, to hold together two ideas that really, on the surface, are mutually exclusive. Because which, what is it? Do I pray for myself? Do I pray for God? Am I praying because um, I'm looking to change my own will or I'm looking somehow to influence him? And the answer is we need to incorporate all of these ideas together in our mind and in our hearts at the same time. But we need to have genuine humility. We cannot expect about anything in the world, but certainly when it comes to tefillah, which Chazal tell us, Omid Barumo Shel Olam, these are among the most transcendent ideas in the entire universe. We cannot expect that given our limitations that we're going to understand everything and anything we would ever want to know about prayer. So we have to continue to march forward. We have to continue to understand davening. And we're going to continue, Be'ezu Hashem, for many, many, many more conversations to talk about davening so we can, to the best of our abilities, understand it. But we need to know that we do ultimately have limits to our understanding. May we be zoche to continue to be inspired to look within, to see feel as an opportunity for self-reflection, for personal growth, as an opportunity for us to reprioritize, but at the same time to recognize that there are things happening that are beyond our comprehension. And when we open the sitter and when we say certain words and when we plug in those coordinates, we are doing something. And we are having an effect that we can never truly understand. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.